möter vi Frank Zappa som sammanfattar sin musikestetik på det här sättet i det här programmet. Var som helst, vad som helst, när som helst och utan någon speciell anledning. Jag slog upp Frank Zappa i radions uh, musikbibliotekskatalog och fann de mest motsägelsefulla titlar på, på rubrikerna där. Revolutionär skivbolagsdirektör, musiker, provokatör, teenibop och avantgardism, prostituerat geni, musikens Groucho Marx och musikens Einstein. Han har ju varit med länge. Han var arg ung man på 60-talet. Han bröt igenom på skivan 1966. Han hade sin stora tid som gitarrist i mitten på 70-talet drog sig tag mot jassen och han har en enorm skivproduktion bakom sig, bland annat bortåt 450 LP-skivor. Under 80-talet så har han minskat sitt turnerande och han har bokstavligen släppt gitarren. Han spelar inte gitarr längre och han har hamnat i andra musikaliska sfärer. Han umgås med Per Boulez, han har spelat med Landens symfoniorkestra och i det här programmet är betecknade nog Karl Heinz Stockhausen med. Här finns alltså inte skymten av en gitarr. Vi möter Frank Zappa hemma i hans hus där han har en mycket välförsedd studio. Vi är bokstavligt talat i tonsättarens verkstad. Och det här är en lång intervju som väl ytterst handlar om drömmen om den perfekta musiken. Och det finns också ett längre musikstycke av honom med i slutet av programmet. Här är alltså dagens Frank Zappa. and then was reinterpreted by the computer to be a synthesizer sound. Beyond serial organization, irrespective of any kind of compositional system, it came out of nowhere and it all seemed perfectly logical to me. Beyond love, I'm uh, very interested in making structures. You can literally make compositions out of dust. The whole body of my work is one composition. That's what music should be. You should, you should be able to organize any kind of a sound and put it into your music. So I wound up with a style of music that has snarks, burps, uh, and dissonant chords, 
and nice tunes and triads and uh, straight rhythms and complicated rhythms and just about anything in any order. Right. And uh, the easiest way to sum up the aesthetic would be anything, anytime, any place for no reason at all. And I think with a, an aesthetic like that, you can have uh, pretty good latitude for being creative. There is nothing that is free of the network of cause and effect. Everything causes everything else. Everything results from everything else. Well, there's two things you ought to consider here. One is the possibility that the whole body of my work is one composition. Right. And only separated into individual tracks, so to speak, because I'm releasing it on records. And it takes me years to put it together. But if I was all done, and you stuck it all together, it's one composition, basically. And a theme that started off in, uh, you know, on the first record could just as easily occur later on with no, uh, no reason other than, since the whole mass of work is one composition, why can't you recapitulate a theme that started off uh, years ago? So when I say, for instance, that I like Vares music, they think that I am a pupil of Vares, but I am not a pupil of Vares. Because in that case, I should be a pupil of Brahms, as I was saying. <laughs> I'm not a pupil of Brahms. I don't think my music looks like the music of Brahms. One of the reasons why my music wound up sounding the way that it does is for the whole idea of what melody is. There are many people who can listen to Varese and say, well, there's no tune there, but I hear melody in Varese. And I hear um, the intervals that he uses, I hear his melodic intervals that all seem, you know, real normal to my ear. I know that uh, by ordinary standards that's very dissonant music. But uh, I liked it. And uh, his concept of uh, music being organized sound was an idea that I could understand you know, on a molecular level that was obvious to me. You know, you have a tendency when you are getting older, you have your own world and you are not satisfied with it maybe, but I mean, you are involved more and more with it. Uh, when you are younger, you have, you have the world for you and you look always uh, around. But I mean, the more you, you want to go deeper, the, of course, deeper you go, the deeper, deeper you go, the more closed in, in your own world you are. When you were younger, you went to these monster movies, you did get involved with, uh, with, with Stockhausen's music, with Varese's music, all at the same time. Did that just come out of nowhere? Yeah, it came out of nowhere, and it all seemed perfectly logical to me. Now, first of all, a European audience is probably not familiar with what the U.S. term monster movie really means, or the reason why a person could enjoy looking at monster movies. Monster movies in the 50s were black and white, cheap, really stupid things that were supposedly done to be serious and scary, but to, to the trained eye were absolutely hilarious. And I used to look at these things not because I thought that, you know, monsters were something uh, fascinating or, or terrifying, but because the production values of these films were so cheap, and the idea that somebody would actually spend hmm, four or five million dollars to make an object like this and present it to the public as entertainment. And the nerve that they would show you a giant spider where you could see the nylon strings making the legs go up and down and expect you to be scared by that. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> So I used to enjoy seeing those things. And at the same time, and that's something that I would do for recreation, but at the same time I was uh, just learning about music and uh, my particular taste in music was in the direction of contemporary classical music and also rhythm and blues. I mean, I was uh, at the same time I would buy the Varese album, I was buying R&B records by black singing groups, quintets doing you know, harmony vocals with very simple chord progressions. And I liked that just as much as I liked what Varez was doing. How many encounters have you had with Bigfoot? Well, I've probably seen him probably a thousand times. I'm in high school, and I ran into uh, Stockhausen at a water fountain out in the hall and just said hello to him, but that was about it. What did he say? Oh, thank you. Hello. <laughs> Isn't that what you're supposed to say when you bump into somebody at a water fountain? What do you do? Should he have turned to me and said, 
You know, that record that you have that you've been listening to for years, it's full of mistakes. <laughs> that would have been good. That didn't mean nothing to the Indians because... Uh... Gold cover. Flashing. <laughs> Not my request, though. <laughs> And down here is something that people should see because we have, oh wait a minute, this, this, oh yeah, this is um, a part from 200 Motels. <laughs> That's it, pour liquid into cheap, I mean, now these are, these are, uh, blow bubbles see? with straw. All right. This, you don't usually ask a chorus to do these things. Right. But right. I, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Exactly. You know, I mean, anybody knows how to go like that to a straw. How did they react back then? Um, they didn't like it. <laughs> Were you thinking in, in terms of, of collages of textures? No, I'm thinking in terms of you can hear these effects if you mic it right. Because all yeah. these things will be balanced out in the mix. Because I knew I was writing for a recording medium. This is something that probably would not sound uh, correct just in a complete acoustical environment. Knock his look in there. Yeah. Right? You know, you get that uh, architectural kind of uh, thick mm -hmm. instrument, uh, chord harmonic kind of stackings. And there you have, there too, all the polyrhythms. Yeah, another yeah. one of those things you'll never hear played right. Yeah. In life. When did you write this? This is about uh, 69 or 70. Mm. There you have some more, some more of these. These rhythms that don't want to be played by orchestra musicians. Yeah. I welcome whatever happens next. Or... F the Jesus, fuck! How aware of you, uh, aware are you of the fact of the difference between acoustical instruments and electronical instruments? Well, I have uh, quite a sensitivity to that because uh, from being in rock and roll for 25 years and having to deal with something that most composers don't, which is multi-track mixing, <clears throat> you learn the, behavior, the behavioral differences between electrical instruments that go through a wire direct into the board or instruments which are heard by a microphone. And you develop certain ideas or an aesthetic about what is a good sound. And um, one of the things about writing for the Synclavier is each of the sounds, the individual samples that are in there, to the extent that you can control the manufacture of the sample itself, you can idealize that sound. So if I have a clarinet part, for example, in this would be a, a hypothetical example. Let's, let's suppose I had done a sampling session and had the absolutely most perfectly recorded clarinet. And each note in each register on the clarinet was perfectly played. I then build something called a patch, which tells the keyboard of the synclavier which of these notes lives under which key. And I then write a clarinet concerto. Well. In the real world, you are never going to get a completely, perfectly recorded performance of every note of what you wrote with a perfectly played sample on every note. That will never happen in the real world, but with this machine, you can do it. But is it really that desirable? Why not? Nobody's ever heard it. Let's listen to it. Right. That's the goal. I mean, if you just want to do what everybody thinks music ought to be, then, you know, get another career. I want to find out what happens if you get these idealized sounds, a whole library of idealized sounds, and then have an imaginary idealized orchestra not only play with 
uh, good tone on every note, the right amplitude on every note, plus at the point where you mix it, you can create an, a separate environment for every instrument with the digital echo. For example, if you imagine a composition where you had a full orchestra hitting a strong chord with all different orchestral timbres, balancing perfectly with a classical guitar. You will never get that in the real world, but you can, you can imagine it, write it, execute it, and hear it using this medium. So this opens up possibilities for any composer who wanted to, you know, allow an audience to hear something he could hear in his brain, but the physics of acoustics would not let you do. That's one of the things that's great about writing in this medium. So, in other words, you're very aware of the fact that the advantages that come out of, let's say, the, 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 uh, the problems that acoustical instruments have are at the moment, at this point in your career in composing, not your primary concern. But no, I'm, I want to surpass, I want to get beyond the problems of normal acoustical instruments. I like acoustical instruments. Basically, what my machine reproduces is the sound of acoustical instruments. It depends on how you write for the machine. Professor! Fred Zinea. To the extent that I can afford the samples. Das ist keine Spielerei, Sie. Das ist ernst. And you have to be crazy enough to invest your cash to teach somebody how to do something that nobody wanted to hear in the first place. Ich weiß gar nicht, was Sie wollen, Herr Doktor. Geschlafen habe ich nicht. Ich habe gearbeitet. All right, let me reroute some of this stuff then. The horns are going to come out of five and six. The oboes are out of one and two, and the violin pits is out of three and four. Okay, I'll also reharmonize the oboes.
Can you turn the pizzicato up, Bob? The pizzicato uh, precedes the oboe note slowly, uh, slightly, just by shifting the whole track. down a little bit in relationship to the pizzicato. Samples are on there. I don't know where they are. Nope, not. And we'll make him um, double the brass. Bring the pizzicatos back. sound and we can split it in half we'll go like this first we'll double the second brass track and put this there we'll take half of it off so one waltz will play with one brass track and the other waltz play with the other Part of this began as a human voice. Huh. Then you have a couple of waveforms in there sound very close. There's four different partials all playing at the same time. And one partial is this. Uh, one's this. synthesized violin. Mm -hmm. That's an FM timbre. Mm -hmm. So you can hear only three of them. This is minus the grit. One of the pitches in there moves microtonally, and everything else moves according to the scale. That little. This has textures in it that remind me of John Cage compositions that I've heard before. piano doubling all of this, we just go like this. Yeah. Well, we could decide that none of that was correct and just replace all the instruments. If I were to tell you, out of the pieces that you listen to, where the material was derived from, you, you, you might, even you might be shocked to see how the stuff was arrived at because of the way that you can process data with that computer. It is unbelievable. 
This takes it like a step beyond serial organization into, it would be a very technical description to show you what happens, but let's just say that the value of an aesthetic concept like the economy of means, which people often speak of in Stravinsky, where you know, these little cells of melodies that get moved around, the synclavier allows you to take that to a ridiculous extreme. I mean, where you can literally make compositions out of dust. Don't you? Of course. I mean, but like numerical dust. I mean, as I hear two glissandos going in opposite directions on a cello solo, yeah. how do you perform that? With the fingers. Yes. Let me show you my instruments, okay. right? Okay. Can I? Sure. This is it. Okay. So this is the, uh, the That's cello. the cello fingerboard? No, violin. Oh, no. <laughs> the cello. Oh, no. And so you calculated it on this? Well, yes, I put my fingers in. Okay, so if you're going to go in two different directions, the bow would have to go under the string, right? Like this. Because two, the, the two outside strings? If you try and do anything that nobody has done before, basically you don't know what, how to call it, you don't know what to say about it, so you've got to invent uh, a little vocabulary for it and um, invent your own processes and invent your own rules. And the rules should be based on whatever it was that sounded good to you when you did that particular experiment. Because my idea is that if, you, if I can do that in a slow way, the virtuoso, the soloist can do that fast, mm -hmm. see? So the bass is here. And even strings. Well, there's even a kind of a string on here, too, so. I don't think a person should limit himself to writing for a synthesizer right. or a sampler or even a live musician. I think that the ideal would be a combination of <clears throat> all types of resources. He's a talking to this wild cougar, and he's a saying zuki zuki in a deep tone of voice. What is zuki zuki? Zuki zuki. Now nobody knows. Well, let's go back to what is a melody. A melody is like a, in one way, it's like a word. You know, the whole melody is a word. The whole melody is also a complex waveform. Because if you look at the melody in terms of where the notes go up and where they go down, you could look at that as if the whole thing was a waveform. And maybe it's an absurd concept, but maybe the human mind, which decodes all other waveforms, which are basically wiggles and shapes like that, in some way can perceive a melody as a waveform over a longer period of time. So if you take the melody and you, know, you, you see it going by like this, if you took it that way and looked at it end to end, you're looking through a climate. Mm -hmm. you flip it back this way and you're seeing it going this way. As it decays in time, as the reverbs decay, you're making um, harmonic statements throughout the melody that don't necessarily have to relate to the chord changes. Then you step back from that and you could say, well, if the melody can be seen this way, then in a much larger scale, the entire composition is a big word, a big complex waveform, a big climate. Now, all of those things have an effect on the human brain and on the, the uh, people's, um, it affects people physiologically. What happens to you if you listen to Beethoven's Fifth as a big climate? You know, da 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 da, it's a word, right? But then there's more, you know, and the, look at the whole thing. You get to live in that climate for the duration of the piece if you choose to do it. What does that do to you? Or what happens to you if you attend Lulu and sit through all of that? That did something to you. <laughs> you know? Or, you know, for those lucky people who can stand to sit through the entire ring. Uh, you're, you're physiologically modified by experiencing this wor world. Uh, and we've seen what the results of that can be. <laughs> it's the make it talk syndrome.
people do not talk like this unless they are very sick. And that's the way m normal music notation is. You see, people talk with rhythms that go all over the place. So why not have melodies that have the same rhythms that resemble human speech? <laughs> was ja viele Techniker gesagt haben, eine vollkommen neue Schwingungsform entdeckt, mit der man Menschen von hier äh, zum äh, Sirius schicken kann. Das ist ja gar nicht undenkbar. Das ist super. Dann wäre das doch ein wunderbarer Akt in meinem Theater, dass das ganze Publikum einfach mal für zehn Minuten ausflippt und einfach auf, auf, auf eine Schwingung aufmoduliert wird und die erscheint dann zehn Minuten lang auf dem Sirius und, und wird dann zurückgerufen. There's a place in France, where they have the ice show. And it's got a 200 cycle hump in the room, and there's a lot of curtains. And so instead of getting a slap back, you get a thud back from the wall. And uh, I'll just keep it in the percussion so you can test that. Die Bewegung des Klanges und dadurch auch die Form der Räumlichkeit des Klanges ist eine neue Richtung in der musikalischen Komposition. I, I like the idea of brass instruments where all the overtones come to life in a place where the room is feeding something back into the sound. What a microphone does is it's a, a substitute for a human ear. Could be a good ear or a bad ear, depending on the quality of the microphone. You put the microphone in, in an ambient environment and you excite the air molecules in that environment. And if it's an interesting environment, it makes the, the instrument which is playing in that environment more interesting, more valuable, and it's a more memorable sample. So a lot of the samples that we have done here at this studio were done back in that room. Are you saying that the uh, that space in composition is a, is a basic factor? Always has been, for me anyway. Right. So when you compose these, the the, in, the excuse me, in mixing, that's called the back to front of the mix. In other words, not only do you want to have stereo like that, you want to be able to see individual uh, instru instrumental placement in the stereo spectrum, but there's the the depth of the mix. Certain instruments are drier than others in the mix, and they sit on the front of this imaginary stereo screen. Other instruments are more ambient, or you have added um, a longer echo uh, delay to it, reverberation delay to it, and they tend to appear to sit, recede in the stereo picture. So when you do, when I think of a composition, I also think of where are these instruments located, not only in terms of an imaginary seating position, but what world are they living in? And when you have a m multiplicity of echo devices at your disposal, <clears throat> and you can create individual environments for these instruments to live in, you get to compose in a way that uh, goes beyond the notes, and goes beyond the overtone series, and goes beyond the other normal compositional things. You're building a world. You're building, your composition can now be its own uh, personalized musical universe. This is beyond Klangfarben melody, for instance. It's far beyond that. Yeah. Right. But it's related to it. Definitely. It's the same principle that is I involved. Yeah. How you see, in, in, in normal tone color melody, the instruments like, uh, I, let's take Webern, for example. Big space in between the notes. It's a dramatic element. And I love to listen to that kind of music. It's great, because you concentrate on what does that instrument sound like. But an idealized performance of Webern is yet to happen because a lot of the places where the Webern has been recorded were not interesting sound spaces. And so when, the, when you have that exposed flute or one tiny little thing over here, that one tiny little uh, tenor sax note, 
you hear it, and it's in a boring room. You know, and I, if I were producing uh, the complete works of Weber, and I would certainly take a different approach to it. I would have, you know, you want to hear the tone color melody? Well, let's color it up. Don't you feel that that, that would be something for you to do, actually? What, to, to type it in? Well, no, but to produce a, a recording of Weber in, in, with this idea behind it. Who would pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to hear my version of Weber and only me? Oh, I'm not so yeah. sure about that. Yeah, you can imagine. You know, I go to Deutsche Grammophon. Hey, listen, guys, why don't you pay me to do yet another version of the complete works of Anton Weber or even the, the complete work, works of uh, Varese? I'm going to take you up on that. I'll go, I'm going to go there and ask them. They'll go, a guy from rock and roll producing this for our esteemed German record company? <laughs> Henning, you must be out of your mind. Well, we'll see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, Henny. No, it's only a joke. Wait. Pifiaco. No, what did Varese say? The, com the composer. Modern day composer refuses to die. Refuses to die. That's if you can imagine putting that into a manifesto, <laughs> people don't even do manifestos anymore. What's happened to the world? <laughs> And, uh, well, there's, there, I, that's a male, no doubt about that, right there. That's a giant of a track. Well, that's a male. Yep, that's a male cast. How can you tell? You know, we have, uh, we are constantly on the search, first on the artistic side, of course, and... Whether you could give an, both of you give an impression of the atmosphere of the beginning of the, the electronic music studio as you experienced it in Los Angeles or in America, and you here in Paris when you started out with Musique Concrete? Well, it was uh, first in the French radio, as you know, as I mean, uh, at this time. Uh, it was a very small studio, and, uh, you know, we were looked at like uh, more or less crazy people. So, I mean, we had uh, these funny ideas. Let me tell you an 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 another anecdote with the Corbusier and him. <coughs> we were once at the place of the Corbusier invited for dinner, and uh, Le Corbusier started saying about music that he had invented uh, uh, the concrete music, that is the recorded music, and therefore the music that you can produce by sounds that are pre-recorded. And he had uh, written about that, uh, calling it uh, music en concert, that is the canned music. Mm -hmm. And uh, Varese afterwards, when we, he didn't say anything, but afterwards he said, how can this man pretend that he had discovered the uh, concrete music. When I did that, it is the organized sound. <laughs> it's interesting. And then you had to perfect whatever technique that could be perfected using gear that was uh, really primitive. I mean, really. And when I started working with tape, I didn't even own a tape recorder. I had to borrow machines from people, and like uh, somebody's father owned a reel-to-reel -reel Pentron tape recorder, but he never used it, and it was in the closet. You know, we could easily wind up uh, wasting the entire show trying to find that reel of tape on the floor. So all of the editing of that you do here? Yeah, it's all done here. And this is parts of material that you would have to gather little bits and pieces from different roles. Uh, to collect them to print the master tape on this machine. And the mixes, m most of the material for that is along this wall. I'll show you. Do you think your Sanaka solo can be along with it? I'm, I can't remember whether or not we mix that from uh, Bremen. But the 88 tour starts here. 
and goes, each one of these is an hour, all the way down to here, and then starts down on this shelf here and runs all the way down to here. And the things where there's missing, that means the things are probably down on the floor someplace. Und doch ist ein äh, Computer, den er gestern gekauft hat, nicht im geringsten in der Lage, vieles von dem äh, zu realisieren, was ich mir schon in den 50er Jahren vorgestellt habe. I think that probably that, that desire lurks in the back of every composer's mind. You know, that the more control they have over their idea, the better chance the audience has to hear what they really had in mind at the point where they came up with the idea. And I hope that one day, you know, in a utopian world, that all composers will be able to do that. But that would be the most fan fanciful thing that I will say during this interview. <laughs> we think Bigfoot's been let out of flying saucers. What do you think? Don't you think it's even necessary or, or it's in any case possible to heighten the understanding and also that feeling by what you can find in structures? If you cared. But there are people who like it just because they like it and they have absolutely no musical training. If they knew, if you started talking to them about structures, they would be turned off. Uh, they like it on a gut level and that's that, or they hate it on a gut level and that's that. Either way, you can't persuade them by talking about the structure or the mechanics in it. The only people who would be interested are maybe musicians, maybe composers, maybe statisticians, certainly not critics because, you know, that, that would spoil all their fun. But, um, <laughs> You know, suffice it to say that the music is structured, no matter what you think it sounds like. There's a reason for everything to be in its place. It's planned that way, and it's when, especially when it's played by the computer, it's being played correctly. Like it or lump it. There it is. That was my idea. So, um, I don't think that it's really worthwhile to dwell on the idea of uh, you know, structural analysis of it. But I will mention that on three occasions, I have been sent treatises, like graduate uh, master's treatise. Or College kids here comes from all over the United States. Man, they want to do a thesis on Bigfoot. They get 100 on it. So I know there are some people who care about structure, but let's say they're really weird. Still. Oh, yeah? <laughs> What is what is evolution if you don't have the if you don't concede the possibility to find these things that are let's say beyond the gut feeling? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I always uh, was under the impression that you know people think that love is something really wonderful to aspire to, and it always occurred to me that love w it, that should be the basis of everything and then the good stuff happens when you get beyond love because love is a mere thing as far as I'm concerned it's mere and all the good stuff you, is out there it's beyond love you have a whole ge generation of people that have never listened to a piece of music without a picture attached to it they don't know that music originally didn't have some kind of picture there you know a record what's that Let's go see a video, you know, and if it's more than three minutes, they've already lost interest in it. Ich sage immer, man kann ja die Augen zumachen und dann hört man die Musik als reine Musik, als rein akustisches Ereignis. Aber Thank you. 
So in the midst of all of this, if you want to try and present something that's brand new to an audience, you have to find a visual element of one type or another. The music either has to be in conjunction with a film, a video, a stage event, dancing, something. It's, it's almost unimaginable for a U.S. market that somebody would buy a ticket to go and sit in a room and hear something played. Do you think this is a sign of the times that'll change again? No. We're headed directly into a predominantly visual no I, I wouldn't say it that way I think we're heading into the dark ages <laughs> I think that Ronald Reagan helped with that a lot he opened the door to the past for us and, and did everything that he could through his policies to set America on this uh, course careening backwards in time past the picket fence back into this you know, world of uh, emptiness Das Ende vom Lied, altes Eisen, verschrottet, tut mir leid. You don't like to go out too much, do you? No. Do you ever go down like to Hollywood here and, and, and walk around the streets <laughs> or what? No. <laughs> If you're ever in a car with somebody who does that for a good time, run. <laughs> that would be a sure sign of bad mental health, boy. Uh, what do you do for a good time? I go down to Hollywood and walk around. Well, I'm probably the only man who ever came to face to face with Bigfoot and lived to tell about it. Well, now, what, what, what? I used to feed him apples right out of my hand. He'd take them out of my hand. He had a hand about a foot wide. <laughs> Want me to charge this crystal for you? Oh, Van, tell her the, the secret word. Oh, yeah. Keep the ad cover. Since Mickey Mouse is probably the most famous cartoon icon in the world, and all you have to do is see, is see this, and you know that's Mickey Mouse. And with Frank Zappa, he's got the most famous facial hair I think all you have to do is see this, and you know that's Frank Zappa, just from that. And Look at this. This is Hollywood. Now, you see this corner here where it says Fat Burger? That used to be a record store, Wallach's Music City. This whole parking lot here was one of the biggest record stores in California. Now, it's a mini mall with things like Raging Fingers, Copymatic. Fat burger. I, I really am missing a lot by not walking around down here, that's for sure. I hope for intelligence rather than politics. Failing that, I hope for easily recognized general disaster that will bring the human race to its senses before it is too late. <laughs> Uh, yeah, or in, the, or in the Bigfoot language, P. Fiatco. What? P. Fiatco. Which means, give me some more apples. It's just like what used to happen a, a long time ago. If the king didn't like what you wrote, you could have your head chopped off. And today, if, if the financier doesn't like what your event is, you have your finance chopped off. So you might as well be dead. <laughs> but still, you continue. Well, I'm in a unique situation. I can, you know, first of all, I can make enough money doing other things to afford to do my hobby, which is writing music. <clears throat> Secondly, 
I'm crazy enough to take the money that I make from doing other things to invest it in that. Pizzicato string sections from the full orchestra, playing little, like, little passages that go over and over again. And the upper part is a short violin. For me to have the luxury of being a composer, I have to do what they call business. I have to do things that generate income. Composing for me, especially this kind of contemporary music, generates nothing and costs a lot of money. I have to do other things which are fairly less interesting than composing. All right. Bye, man. <laughs> First of all, I am still doing business, and I'm actually in the studio now working on a new album for next year. Let's say I've got a, a good week where I don't have any of the business interruptions. Yeah. I'll wake up whenever I wake up. I'll eat a bowl of cereal, I'll drink a cup of coffee, I'll smoke a cigarette, and I'll come downstairs and I'll go to work until I'm tired. Did you go in there? And then I'll get up and go to bed. And yeah. then I'll do it all over here. again. Some weeks I'll spend like three or four days building in imaginary instruments. What mattered in the end was whether you as a composer enjoyed listening to what you wrote. In the United States it's difficult to really feel that you're part of any kind of ongoing musical tradition because... I try to escape from any tradition. First, if I knew the direction, it would be terribly boring to go, in, to go into this direction, which is interesting to go into the unknown, more or less. It's on Anything, anytime, any place, for any reason at all, that's the leitmotif. A Joyce preferred comedy to tragedy. Ah, Herr Daumen! Das ist ja unser Hand! Well, the thing that's of the region of what I write is basically, you know, I'm, my region is my house plus television. So that's basically my contact with the outside world. You take where I live and add all the TV that you can receive in this place, which brings me normal American life through a wire. And add to that um, what I experience when I travel on tour, and that's, that's my uh, ethnic uh, source material. So that's not quite like a guy living in a village writing a little doodad because the sheep are coming in on Wednesday. It's another, another thing. So my cultural base is not really isolated. It's like, it's more mixed up. went up again. Uh oh. It's never gonna end. <laughs> It'll end when his tape runs out.